Okay, so it is my privilege to introduce our next um, speaker. Um, Dr. Andrew Young is a hematology oncology fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. Andrew and is, um, is fascinated by clonal evolution and understanding why we get cancer. During his MD PhD training, he developed methods for rare somatic mutation detection. This led to the discovery that clonal hematopoiesis, ostensibly healthy hematopoietic cells harboring leukemia associated mutations in disease free individuals was a ubiquitous phenomenon by middle age. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Young. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank, thanks so much. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you all today, kind of giving the, uh, you know, the, the idea or the discussion of cancer through the oncologist perspective and um, specifically how it uh, pertains to the fire service. Um, I think about this a lot as an oncologist in St. Louis, seeing patients with cancer and then um, studying it in the lab, but also as someone who was a firefighter for about a decade before going to medical training in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland um, many moons ago. So the talk uh, has actually been really set up well by the previous three talks and the talks yesterday to give a good idea of um, how environmental exposures introduce DNA damage. And, and now I'm going to kind of give you the kind of other, other side of that, um, what happens or what we understand about cancer, and especially as a geneticist or genomicist, like how all of the new technologies that you see on, on TV and you see in, in the news, how those are actually changing our understanding of cancer. And, and affecting new, new treatments and, and cures in a lot of cases for uh, this devastating disease. And then how we can use and leverage those technologies to kind of advance our understanding of cancer and reduce cancer risk, especially in, uh, in firefighters. All right, so to begin, I uh, just, and Dr. DeMarini set this up perfectly yesterday. So this is a little bit of a review, but to, whenever you talk about cancer, I think it's very helpful to think about the genetics behind it and that begins with kind of the cell. We got trillions of them in our body. They all do different jobs. Inside of, uh, inside of each cell, there's a nucleus which contains your genome. That genome is three billion base pairs or letters long. It's a book that's three billion letters long. Every cell has, has one. And that, that genome encodes all of the functions of what makes your neuron a neuron and your skin a skin cell. And the functional units of this genome are genes here, which make proteins, which are the enzymes and transcription factors that do the, do the hard, heavy lifting in the cells. And now in the last kind of two decades, the technology has advanced so much that we can read out this nucleotide sequence in thousands of cells and really start to understand what's happening at a genetic level in, in tumors and in a, a wide variety of, of other diseases. Now, a lot of the talks that we've heard so far talk about mutation and uh, PAHs and all these different uh, environmental exposures that are mutagens, but what's happening in the, in the actual cell itself? And we heard some of uh, this kind of discussed yesterday, but um, looking at what causes genetic changes, changes in this three billion base pair genome, a lot of it is, is stuff that we've talked about, like environmental exposures and UV damage, sun exposed damage, but a lot of it is just the cells dividing. Every time your cell divides to replenish your skin or replenish your blood cells, it's got to copy that three billion base pair genome, and, and it's hard to do that reliably um, every single time. And so that's actually a, a big source of, um, of genetic change over time. And a lot of it is heredity, things that you inherit from your parents. Um, that all of that machinery for making that, that copy of your genome every time your cell divides is inherited from your parents. And Everyone has kind of different uh, fidelity of those, uh, of those processes. Whenever one of these mutations occur um, kind of after birth, we call it a somatic mutation, and these are uh, terms that we'll use throughout the talk. Now when we look at the kind of end result of all of that um, mutation, we when we, and we think about cancer, there are several hallmarks of cancer or changes that happen in these genes, in these functional components of the cell that make a, a cancer a cancer. And some of these are the ability to resist cell death, to proliferate with kind of unrestrained growth. Other things are uh, inducing angiogenesis or bringing blood vessels to your tumor to give you extra nutrients. Um, and then uh, invading and surrounding other tissues. Normally your, your liver is real good at keeping its liver cells inside the liver, but in cancer that, that breaks down. And these are some of the processes that can, can change to, to make a cancer a cancer. 
So in the end, cancer is, is the end result of genetic alterations that endow a cell or group of cells with the ability for uncontrolled growth. And that's the kind of lens that we think about um, cancer, the end product of all that mutagenesis um, stuff that we've been talking about this morning and yesterday. So the paradigm of physician scientists to, to study this disease is something that we call translational research or bench to bedside research. So the kind of model you start with a patient in the lab or a population with a disease or something you want to study, you take the samples, you bring them to the lab, you study them in the lab, you figure out what makes that cancer tick and how to, how to treat it, come up with ideas to test it like Vinny has done for his career, take those drugs into patients, see how they work, bring it back to the lab, tweak it, make it better, and, and the cycle repeats itself. And that's how the kind of modern model of the, the physician scientist research is, um, is done. All right, so you saw this slide already, and uh, I actually stole this slide from the, the next speaker, so you may see it again. But I think this very elegantly displays kind of our current understanding of uh, tumor genesis. And just to kind of walk through this again, we heard a lot about, you know, at the, at the beginning of this, um, this kind of path, the initial DNA damage and how PAHs can, can induce those damages. And the genome's big. Most of those, that DNA damage, those mutations that are introduced, they're benign. They, we don't really, they fall into regions of the genome where we, we don't really know what it does and usually doesn't have an effect. But it's uh, every once in a while, those changes can uh, endow a cell, can mutate those genes that we talked about on the previous slide to in, in introduce new functions like self-sufficient growth, resistance to cell death, invasion, and then the eventual production of a, of a tumor. So I just want to provide a couple examples of, uh, I know we, we hear about how the technology is improving, but I want to give you like a couple concrete examples of what this technology has showed us and shown us and how um, that information improves um, treatment for this disease and then hopefully prevention as we've alluded to a bunch uh, in this conference so far. All right. A lot of this work is done uh, through sequencing and this is just an example of one of the sequencing platforms that, uh, that we use. So this is an example for non-small cell lung cancer. And this is uh, the end result or the end product of, of a decade of, of work looking at lung cancers and using that sequencing technology to find the differences between a lung cancer cell from a healthy cell. And what's, what's fascinating is that every person that comes to clinic, every patient with lung cancer has a different set of mutations that, that define and drive that cancer. But what we found through all these sequencing efforts is that they kind of coalesce and, and funnel down through a discrete finite number of pathways, and that's kind of uh, described here. So even though every patient has a different set of mutations that drive their tumor, a third of them will have alterations in that gene, that functional unit of the genome, the KRAS gene. Others will have EGFR mutations, and a kind of whole slew of other um, genes that can be altered. And when you know what is driving a cancer, then you can start developing treatments to, to target that. And in fact, in the last kind of decade, uh, a, a bunch of these different alterations have been targeted with drugs that in many cases are, are, are very efficacious. Here's a review article that kind of just cartoonizes. Um, this is that kind of another version of that cell that we showed on the first slide. And these are all the different genes or proteins that can be altered in lung cancer and the pathways that they signal through to tell your nucleus, here's another cartoon of the nucleus, to, to grow, resist cell death, do all those hallmarks of cancer that we talked about. And in this slide, these are all the drugs now that are FDA approved to target the different pathways that drive lung cancer. <coughs> so I think one, th one thing Vinny tasked me with uh, in this presentation is um, to kind of dispel this myth that, that cancer is a death sentence. And I, I definitely remember that from when I worked in the fire service, just this kind of overwhelming kind of uh, uh, sense of doom for patients newly diagnosed with cancer. And in fact, the first question most people ask when they come to their oncologist with a new diagnosis is, you know, am I going to die from this? And so I would say that, you know, across the board, now this is just lung cancer I'm, I'm describing here, in kind of every other cancer under the sun now, we have a lot of new technology, new treatments that are, are coming out. And so many cancers that even just when I started training five, 10 years ago that were universally fatal now are highly treatable and uh, in a lot of cases curable. Things that had less than one year survivals like melanoma now are, are highly treatable and in many cases curable. 
So I just want to provide maybe a little bit of hope that you know, this is what the technology can show us, and this is how uh, it can be leveraged to, to come up with new treatments and, uh, and, and really make a difference on the kind of the treatment um, side of things. We also uh, have, have learned that there are many different ways that your cell changes to become cancer. And I think in, in a lot of what we talk about here in, in this conference, we really focus on, on individual things, and I kind of want to uh, maybe provide a little more context that when a patient comes to their oncologist and they ask, how did I get this, you, there's a, a lifetime of exposures that are all kind of layered in together. And here is a kind of an example, or here's a summary of all the kind of different things that are, are, are at work together when a, when a patient develops a cancer. And we kind of divide them into things that you can do something about and things you can't do anything about. So in the uh, unmodifiable risk, a lot of those are things that you can't control. Or I guess they're unmodifiable, such as how old you are. You know, every time your cell divides, those changes can, are introduced, and, and that is a big risk factor for getting cancer. Also, <coughs> the, the genes that you inherited for your parents uh, from regarding how well you repair your DNA and replicate your DNA, that's also a huge risk factor and contributor to cancer risk. And then all the things that we talk about are also significant, like environmental exposures like smoking, firefighting, and, um, and uh, other environmental um, exposures. I'll give you just kind of two examples of how, how we know this. Um, here's one example and to understand the genetic risk factors for cancer. And I think people are familiar with kind of like BRCA mutations for breast cancer. This is kind of another, another way that we, we know that inherited risk is important. This is, um, I think yesterday someone talked about Scandinavian studies that are amazing because they have such good uh, population data. So this is a Scandinavian study of, I think, 40,000 twins. And they just asked a simple question. If you have an identical twin where they share all their genetic material between them and their sibling, is there a higher incidence of concordant cancer where both twin gets cancer compared to non-identical twins? And for colon, prostate, and breast cancer, they were able to say if one identical twin gets cancer, the other identical twin is more likely to get that cancer than a non-identical twin. So it really shows us that you know, a lot of this risk is, is kind of from your parents and you, you can't pick your parents, I guess. Now on the other end of the spectrum, looking at these exogenous risk factors, uh, we've heard a lot about the epidemiologic studies that have looked in um, model systems to see how individual agents uh, can cause DNA damage. But you can actually look from the other direction, looking at the tumors themselves. And if you know what a person was exposed to or kind of what context the tumor arose in, you can actually identify signals that tell you um, what the uh, exposure looked like. So a lot of this has been cataloged at the UK, at the Catalog of Somatic Mutations in Cancer, the COSMIC database. And this is one plot of a group of tumors where they've used this DNA sequencing technology to find all of those somatic mutations, those changes in the genome that are present in a tumor. And they've kind of grouped them and color coded them here by what type of mutation they are. These are the C nucleotide becoming an A, which happens in this group much more frequently than the other types of mutations. And this is a pattern seen in cancers arising in the setting of tobacco use. So for smokers and lung cancers that arise in the setting of smoking, they have this very characteristic pattern, which from kind of the other direction of looking at the tumors versus looking at the, the carcinogens themselves and trying to figure out what changes are being made, you can actually find these patterns that are, um, are pretty unique to the exposure you're getting. Here are some other examples. This is a totally different pattern that's seen in uh, skin cancers that are arise from UV damage. And this is uh, another example of oxidative damage. Okay, so how do you now think about this through the lens of, of being a firefighter? So I told you the first question that people ask when they come to their oncologist with a new diagnosi diagnosis of cancer is, is, will I die from this? That's usually the first question. The second is, how did I get this cancer? And, and this is so pertinent here, and I think it's been very helpful to hear all the different kind of stories and uh, experiences of people with, um, with cancer in the fire service. And I think that from the oncologist's perspective, it, it's super complicated. Um, and when, when you look at uh, kind of the available data, I know this has already been talked about at length, 
you know, for these two cancers, we have very strong evidence that mesothelioma and bladder cancer are caused by firefighting exposure. But even if they're caused by firefighting exposure, if, if an individual presents with one of these cancers, it's a kind of a layer cake of genetic risk from their parents, lifetime other exposures, cell divisions, just how old you are, and this is adding to that, um, maybe to that layer cake of cancer risk. Maybe that's a bad analogy, I don't know. But, uh, but everyone's kind of layer cake is different, and the threshold where you get cancer is different in everyone. And so even though we know these are, these are strong, strong environmental exposures that can cause cancer, it's happening in a, a very complicated system where there's a lot of things kind of all um, working, working against you maybe, I don't know, working together, working against you. So when you have uh, situations where there's limited, limited evidence of colon cancer, prostate cancer, testicular, other cancers with firefighter exposure, you know, I, I, think, I think the layer cake analogy is still useful. There's, there's probably some contribution. We, we don't know exactly how big that is, but it, it happens in this very, very complicated system. And then even things like, um, like lung cancer, I think you know, it, there's probably some risk from it, but we don't, we don't know. We don't have the evidence for that yet, and it's hard to, to really clearly disentangle that. And this is where I think the next two talks that I'm kind of introducing will help uh, kind of push the envelope um, to help help us understand a lot of this better. So kind of the conclusion here is that there are a lot of, lot of different risks that contribute together to, to give a single person cancer. All right, so we've talked about research kind of at the, the genetic research, genomic research done at the kind of tumor end and what some of that has shown us. And I, uh, I want to kind of talk just a little bit about, I know we've had a lot of great talks uh, about kind of the toxicology research, and I may be a little sheepish talking about this with all these experts in the room, um, but I just want to give a vignette of how the technology has really changed this field and kind of maybe how we can marry the two uh, together moving forward. So uh, historically, and uh, I never did any of these experiments, but I know people in the room have, if you wanted to find if an agent was mutagenic, you, you fed it to a mice or you, you, a mouse or you painted it on their skin and, th and then you waited. And you waited until they got tumors. And that readout of developing a tumor was how you inferred that a, uh, an agent was mutagenic. And uh, advancements in the uh, kind of after that in making these uh, exotic transgenic mice um, that I'm not gonna really explain all the details of allowed you now to not have to wait for the tumor to form but be able to pull out little pieces of DNA from those, um, from those animals and look for those mutations. It could give you basic information about how, how often a mutation occurred, but didn't have a lot of resolution or, um, or really explain the process that was happening. Now, newer advancements in the last kind of five years, which you'll hear about in the, in the next talk, allow you to now just use regular mice off the shelf, give them their exposure, and just look directly in the tissue for these patterns of somatic mutation like I showed you from the Cosmic database, which can tell you if your, your novel agent gives you a pattern of mutation that looks like something you know, like tobacco exposure or UV exposure, and give you an idea months to years before you'd have to wait to, to see a tumor. And I think that you can use this same technology to look in firefighters to look for these DNA damage changes that happen like years before you'd be, you'd be looking for a cancer. All right, so I gave you an idea of what we know from looking at the tumors themselves and about the mutational process and how different agents can induce mutations. But I think the future of, of our field and, and kind of the efforts that, that we wanna pursue are to understand this process. How do the tumors form? How can we use that to detect uh, the cancers early? To use Vinny's analogy, you know, putting out the fire when it's on the stove top. Can you use this, this technology to really catch these things early before they're clinically significant and maybe before they're even, even cancer. And can you use that to reduce cancer risk? So I'll give you one, uh, one story about what this type of research would look like, um, told through the, through the lens of uh, blood cancer. All right, so bear with me for a second. This is a study of a disease called acute myeloid leukemia. It's a blood cancer, it's pretty rare. But through large sequencing efforts, we, we know all of the mutations that drive this type of cancer, and those are plotted here. And uh, th each of these is a different gene, one of those functional units of the genome. 
and the y-axis is the number of patients in this study that had an alteration in that gene. These are all people with leukemia, and these are the mutations in the leukemia. Remarkably, if you look in healthy people, not firefighters, not people with other cancers, just healthy people, you can actually find these same mutations in their blood cells, and this phenomenon, which we've termed clonal hematopoiesis, increases in prevalence with age, such that by about 70 years old, 10% of people will have these mutations detectable in their blood. These are people without cancer that have cancer-associated mutations detected in their, in their blood cells. Having one of these mutations increases your risk of getting blood cancer. So plotted here is the x-axis in time and months, so going out to 150 months, that's 10 years, or longer, I guess, 12 years. You see that there's an increased risk of, or that there's an, uh, a rate of getting blood cancer if you don't have a mutation detected, but if you have one of these mutations detected, you have about a 5% chance of developing blood cancer. And that's a, it's a high risk compared to the, to the non-mutated um, population. But maybe the glass half full view of this is that 95% of people with these leukemia associated mutations do not get blood cancer at you know, 10, 12 years. And the, um, the technology that was used to, to make this finding is, is relatively crude. The, the mutation in the blood has to be pretty large. The number of cells that have the mutation has to be pretty big for you to find it. And work that I did in my PhD that could find these mutations at even lower frequencies actually found them kind of ubiquitously in everyone by uh, their 50s. This is a study of 20 healthy nurses uh, plotted here. And each, in each nurse, these are healthy nurses that have no cancer. We can find, this is the number of mutations we found per individual, and these are the genes that we found those mutations in. And these are basically the same genes that you see in the, in the leukemia people. But this, this is 95% of people here, 50-year-olds, and it's at such a high rate in this study that almost all of them will, will not get blood cancer. So, um, yeah, and then one other thing we could do in the study, because we had serial bank samples 10 years apart, is track these mutations over time. So this is a plot here of an uh, individual that was banked in their 50s and then in, in their 60s, and we could see the mutation increase in prevalence in this person. Again, they don't have cancer. And looking kind of across our study group, we could see that in some cases the mutations decreased in frequency, some stayed the same. But this is giving us an idea of this mutation process that's happening in, in people who don't have cancer, who most in most cases will never get cancer, but it's showing us kind of in, in the natural history of how these mutations arise and um, can persist in, in a healthy person. I think this happens in all of our tissues. Actually, there's data now published that this happens in skin and, and uh, liver and esophagus and other, other tissues. And I think that we can, we can study this in firefighters and use it as, an, as a marker for how DNA damage is, in, is introduced into, into firefighters and kind of how it persists and what the, you know, the kinetics are, to quote Vinny from this morning, of these mutations over time. Are they cleared out by the immune system? How, how does something that we see in a leukemia that's in a healthy person just stay like totally flat and not change for a decade? It's like, it's maybe it's, un it's surprising that the, this is, these things can be this stable over, over time. So kind of moving forward with these types of technologies and findings in mind, how can we apply this to, to improve outcomes for firefighters with cancer and, and maybe for firefighters before they get cancer? So I think that the biggest thing that we can do is, is just to bank, the is to bank the samples. And we were talking um, to a, actually a, a bunch of different groups here that um, you know, had had an exposure that they were worried about. And, and we can do these types of studies months or years down the road, but, but you, can't, you can't do it if the samples weren't banked when the exposure happened. And I, and I know this is a challenging thing, and, and I'm excited for these workshops this afternoon to kind of brainstorm how we can, how we can do this. But the biggest thing that, that the fire service can do is to, to bank these samples with, with good kind of phenotype data of exposure and kind of health records for, um, for firefighters. Now, the, the talks yesterday, uh, I think it was especially poignant of making the point of, you know, no one wants to be a lab rat. And I, I, I definitely think about that a lot. And so I think in the short term, 
there are things that we can do to return um, this, all of these advancements in the kind of science and technology to the fire service. And one is through uh, improved screening. And the second talk you'll hear after me is about one of those screening platforms. And I think that is a way where, where this technology can be directly um, you know, used to benefit uh, uh, the fire service. And then all of these studies that we've kind of uh, outlined here, I think could in the long term be used to help firefighters by understanding how these tumors form and, in, and hopefully to, to prevent them. So here's just like one example of a, of a potential study where I think you could use this type of technology to actually measure those interventions. So we heard a lot earlier this morning about decon techniques and how in some cases you, uh, you can reduce the, the carcinogen exposure, in some cases you can't, but the end result of a lot of that carcinogenic exposure is, is mutation. So here's an example of how we could use these technologies to see if an intervention is working. I have uh, many, many memories of doing salvage and overhaul in my gear for, for hours and being covered in you know, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And you know, I, I think one intervention we could, you know, we, could, we could think about is if you have half of your firehouses in a, in a district, do the status quo, and the other half we do, everyone wears a Tyvek bunny suit and, uh, and a respirator. And when you're done, you peel it off, you throw it in the trash, you take a shower, and we don't measure, we, we measure all of those aromatic hydrocarbons like we've been doing, but we also look in the blood and we see if there are any of those somatic mutations that are introduced and if they fall into specific patterns of exposure that we know are associated with different uh, carcinogens. And we can also then understand the kinetics of, of these mutations over time or in the, in the blood cells over time and hopefully get an idea of, of what's happening without having to wait for people to develop cancer. Um, so with this, uh, I'd like to finish by saying that you know all of these studies, all of these uh, advancements require close collaboration between the fire service, academic research, and industry. It requires a lot of trust. I think that these forums are perfect to, to have those conversations. So um, with that, I'll, I'll finish. I'd like to just say that we started with the bench to bedside research model, but maybe in the fire service for cancer prevention, we can think about the bench to back step to bedside model where we study firefighters, we study patients with cancer, we look in the lab, we come up with interventions, and then we use that to improve care kind of uh, through the circle moving forward. I'd like to thank the Wheaton Volunteer Rescue Squad where I uh, spent my youth, and then the Washington University Physician uh, Scientist Program and the, the lab that I work in. Thanks. <laughs> Couple questions? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I'm, I'm actually not gonna answer that because the next talk will, will answer that. It's actually how that technology works and kind of what those uh, limits of detection are. But yeah, that's a, it's a great question and I, I think that's the kind of key to finding out what's happening before you have um, cancer. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Comment is that cancer is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, a question about non-small cell versus small cell cancer. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a question about AML versus CML. I, I think there, there's some kind of the intrinsic biology that makes those diseases a little bit different, where CML is driven by a, a canonical fusion, so it's a little bit different disease. Maybe there's too much in the weeds, but. Um, we can talk about that uh, after the break. <laughs>
that's exactly what I pitched to. Uh, the, the question is, is it useful to pool together tumors from firefighters to look at them uh, distinct from kind of non-firefighters? And that's exactly what I pitched uh, Dr. Caban yesterday. So. Yeah, I bet you they look different. Yeah. That's exactly the kind of work that I do. Um, the question was about uh, tumors that arise after specific exposures and whether we could look at them for different mutational signatures that are, um, you know, that distinguish them from other tumors that arrive, arise without um, kind of the firefighting exposure. And I, I think that that's, that's where we should, where one av avenue that we should go next. It's exactly what I, I, I think that too. Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's, the question is whether we should do mutational detection in a periodic fashion in firefighters. I think it's, um, it, it's, it's hard, it has to be done in a very kind of intentional um, fashion where everyone is, is kind of aware of the risks and benefits. So I think one example is, let's say we do this and I tell you you have one of these mutations in your blood. It, it's very easy to latch onto that and think, oh, I'm gonna get cancer, game over. But, but on the flip side of that, I can tell you that with sensitive enough tools, I can find these mutations in everybody. And so it, it's, we still don't know what, you know, from the earlier studies, what that 5% are that get cancer versus the 95 that have the same type of mutations and don't. So I, I think you have to you have to be very clear with what these things can show and can't show, but um, I mean this is the way to to understand the kind of stepwise process that eventually gets to cancer, and then if any of your interventions can actually stop that process in people who who don't have cancer. Um, all right, last question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question is about whether you, there could be a choke point to affect the vasculature of tumors, and there's actually a whole uh, slew of drugs that target the vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGFR, and the, one of the mechanisms, uh, like bevacizumab is one of these medicines that you use to, in the hypothetical way it works is by, uh, by affecting blood supply. <laughs>